All right. Yeah. Thanks so much, Erin. Um, and thank Square Pig Society for getting this organized. I'm super excited to be chatting about executive functioning. So I just wanted to start off with kind of what I'm going to go through today. I'm going to talk briefly about what OT is as well as autism and OT. Uh, then we're going to get into kind of the meat of what we're here for. I'm going to chat a little bit about executive functioning um, and the all the different skills that rely on executive functioning. And then lastly, I'm going to have an example that hopefully brings all the stuff we've chatted about, we ties it together in a neat little bow, breaks it down really nicely for you. So let's jump right into it. So I'm just going to start with a general, what do occupational therapists do? Um, because we see them in a lot of different spaces, which can be a little bit confusing. So I'm going to start general and get more specific and then jump into so occupational therapists, we are collaborative problem solvers, and we work with people on what they want and need to be able to do um, using occupation. So all the different things that we do to occupy our time. We work with folks across the lifespan, from the elderly to infants, and what we do depends on the person, what they want or need to do, and where they are. So we work with folks on everything from the very basics of getting up in the morning and getting dressed to finding things that you're interested and passionate about um, to like helping people get well or stay well. So there's a huge spectrum. And uh, we tend to shine in complex situations where there are a lot of moving parts. And often in complex situations where there are a lot of moving parts, it also means there's a team there. So it's not uncommon for OTs to work with a physiotherapist or a speech language pathologist or coordinate, be coordinating with a family doctor to help people um, with whatever they are working on. And we also work with folks in a wide variety of settings, to see us in hospitals, um, job sites and schools, all over the place. Um, and so because we are kind of there is so much diversity in what we do and where we work, the kind of core that brings it all together is that we believe that doing things that are meaningful and, and important helps people get well and stay well, and that participation can be improved or harmed by the environment. So the classic example of this is there might be a set of stairs to get into a business and a person who is a wheelchair user might have difficulty getting into that business. But as soon as you put a ramp there, you've changed the environment and made it a lot easier. And we also believe that diversity is an asset. It takes lots of different, um, lots of different people with lots of different ideas and different brains and different abilities to make a world that's rich and interesting. And so, like I said, I wanted to start with the general because you could see an OT coming out of the hospital who's going to make sure that when you go home, you can get home safely doing the things that you need to do to recover. But let's dive in a little bit more into autism and OT. Oops, here we go. So this is a resource that we use when people come to us and they say, okay, my doctor said I should see an OT, but I don't really know what they do or how we help. And so this is kind of a jumping off point that we sometimes use. And I'm not gonna go through each of them because um, I wanna make sure other speakers have time to chat, but I'll just dive into a few of them. So one of them is regulation. So being able to manage big emotions. And part of regulation can include finding tools that work to help with managing those big emotions. And they could be physical tools, like a weighted blanket, but they also can be tools like building self-awareness. Let's say going to the grocery store is a challenge, it's overwhelming. So the tool might be making sure that you've planned it out in advance, knowing what you wanna get, where to find it in the store, um, and picking a time maybe when the grocery store is a little bit less busy. And so it's, again, it's not a physical tool, but it's kind of that cognitive tool to plan it up. 
And that regulation also kind of intersects with sensory. So for example, maybe going to the grocery store is overwhelming. Um, and part of that is because there is so much visual information. There's all sorts of things on the shelves in the store. There's people walking around unpredictably. Um, maybe they have those awful <laughs> overhead fluorescent lights that flicker. Um, and so understanding kind of the sensory system helps us understand what tools might be useful. And also, understanding the sensory system, while it might be challenging in one situation, might be an asset in another. Maybe that attention to visual information is also, um, it's maybe makes you an incredible artist. I have one, one person that I, that I work with who, again, is an amazing artist, and he draws the corner of rooms when he draws them, or he'll notice the trim on cars. And so he's able to make these hyper-realistic things. That, that visual system that was a challenge in the grocery store is an asset when it comes to his art, which, again, kind of interplays with resilience. How can we take the things that, um, that are kind of innate to you and use them as strengths? I also wanted to briefly touch on anxiety. OTs, we are trained to do some mental health support. But this is an area where often we'll be um, collaborating with other people. That working as part of a team often shows up in here where we might be working with a, a counselor or a family doctor, making sure that the things that they are implementing in the clinic or in therapy are applicable to real life. And then of course, we have executive functioning which is what we are going to spend the bulk of the time chatting about today. So I'm going to go to the next slide here. When we boil down what is executive functioning, when we yeah, boil it right down to kind of its essence, it is the ability for us to juggle our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. And that sounds kind of simple when we really break it down. But there's a lot going on there. And like I said, I'm gonna have an example coming up where we can kind of really parse out what I mean by those different things. Um, but yeah, so executive functioning, our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. Let's chat a little bit about some of the skills that are associated with executive functioning. And there's a whole bunch. Some of them that you saw on the poster for this uh, for this session. But as you can see, there's a whole bunch. And similar to the last slide, I'm not going to go through every single one, but I do want to highlight a few. So there are things like flexibility in thinking and adaptability in problem solving. This is something that we are doing all the time, every day, um, in everything that we do. It's kind of those little internal questions that you ask yourself as you're going through an activity. Let's say you're cooking something. It's kind of as you're making it, asking yourself, is that, is this bowl gonna be big enough or can that go in the microwave? Or, oops, I don't have that ingredient. Now, how am I gonna make that work? And then being able to ask those questions and come up with answers and kind of roll with the ebbs and flows that come with kind of the everyday questions that come up. I also wanted to chat a little bit about starting activity. Fancy word for this is called initiation. And it is something that I hear a lot of where people come to me, they'll say, oh, you know, this person, they are so smart. They are so capable. And they, they, I know they know how to do it, but getting started is so hard. And so when we look at the literature, talking about initiation, and in particular, the literature that highlights autistic folks' voices uh, and their lived experiences, we see initiation kind of gets broken down into these three categories. Um, oh boy, here we go. So there are the, the section of thought. thought. So this is being able to think about an activity and break down all the steps to get started. First, I'm gonna do this. Then I'm gonna do this. After that comes, and making the list. 
And for some folks, the first step of breaking down the list of how you do each step is really difficult. And then we kind of move into feelings. One, one thing that'll sometimes happen is people will be able to break it down. And then they'll look at the list and it's super long. And then they'll start to feel overwhelmed. Like, holy smokes, this is a lot. Am I going to be able to do it all? And that's where we start, into, start to get into the realm of feelings. And also, it's um, more likely for autistic folks to live with anxiety than the neurotypical population. So this is also a piece of that. When I'm thinking about what's coming up next, is it going to work for me? Kind of all the unknowns of a situation this, uh, that make it difficult to start, that fits into the feeling section of initiation or starting a task. And then we also have the action section. So there is kind of a newer concept that's being or that's showing up in the literature. The fancy word for it is called catatonia. It's when your body feels frozen. So you might be um, you might be feeling really overwhelmed, and you might be thinking to yourself, oh, "If I could just get a, like pull this weighted blanket up, feel the weight of it on me, I would be able to relax a little bit." And my brain might be screaming at me, "Just sit up." Just reach to the end of the bed. Just pull it up. But there, um, but you might be feeling frozen. And so even though your brain knows what to do, that action piece is the difficulty. And like I said, that's kind of a, a newer one that is just being explored and understood a little bit more. But we have all these different sections for why initiation might be hard. There's also things like organization, planning and prioritization, and things like stress tolerance. How do you deal with things that change or when there's a lot going on at once? And part of the reason that I put this visual here in the bottom on is because I wanted to highlight that a lot of these skills or these brain-based processes are intermingled and interdependent. It might be that to be able to prioritize what you need to do, you need to organize first. Or maybe your planning and prioritizing skills are, they're interlinked with your organization skills. Um, it might be that manage the metacognition or moderate, like self-monitoring, being, being able to notice where you are at, impacts your ability to manage emotions and feelings. Or of course, that uh, things like getting started impacts your ability for to focus on long-term goals. So all of these are kind of going all in one, all at once. So it's not necessarily a super simple, if we just work on this piece, then this will happen. Because there might be three or four different pieces happening at once. But let's jump into an example to break down kind of what I mean by um, executive functioning and breaking it into thoughts, feelings, and actions. So the example that we're going to do is uh, getting up in the morning and going to work, something that lots of us do on a regular basis. I'm just going to switch screens here so that I can draw while I'm chatting with you. So I have a little bit of a graph that we're going to use to organize what goes into thoughts, what goes into feelings, and what goes into action. And one thing to remember with this is that we all have a threshold. I'm going to put it way near the top. This is our threshold for too much when we become overwhelmed and need to take a break or do something restorative. So again, let's go back to uh, getting ready for work. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to wake up in the morning. And that is already where we interact with the first step of executive functioning. It comes with quality of sleep. Let's say you stayed up later, but you start at an early, you have an, an earlier starting job. And it's pretty common for autistic folks to have a slightly shifted circadian rhythm where lots of people tend to be night owls. But we're navigating a, a neurotypical world where there might not be the flexibility to start when actually would work best for you. So you're starting the day tired, which makes things a little bit more difficult. So we're going to put a, oops, I'm just gonna 
take a copy of this box here. We are going to put our first box in the category of actions. It is harder to get things done when you are tired. And now, okay, so we've woken up. We're feeling tired, but we have at least gotten ourselves out of bed. Thank goodness. Now we have, we're gonna, we're gonna get dressed. So that might be thinking about what you're gonna wear. Is it gonna be a good fit? Am I expressing myself the way I want to? So let's put a box in box. But maybe, before we go too far with this, maybe you are the kind of person who wears the same thing every single day. You wear your regular black t-shirt with your gray sweatpants, and that is what you're comfortable in. And because you've built that routine that is consistent, you don't have to think about it. Now we get to take, uh, now we get to take away that box. So that in some ways is really adaptive. Remember, we only have so much before we get to this threshold of too much. And so by where, by having that routine, you've taken a box away. Now, granted, Don't that might be something that's only adaptive three months of the year. Months. And when it's mm -hmm. summertime and 35 degrees outside, it's not working for you as well. But I, re I really encourage you to think about the reframe. Uh, sometimes those routines, doing the same thing the same way every, every day, is a way to stay under that threshold of overwhelm. Okay, so we're wearing the same clothes every day, fantastic. We don't, we don't have to put a box in box, easy. Maybe this person in the morning needs to take some medication or some vitamins at breakfast. And um, it's depending on how they're set up, that might be more, more challenging or it might be easier. It might be um, like a bubble pack where you pop them out and you're ready to go, that might be pretty easy. Or maybe you have a couple bottles where you have to take, you have to remember to take two of this one, one of this one, and kind of a half of another one, or maybe it's like two days or whatever. So let's put a box in box for that one. And then maybe those pill bottles are a little difficult to open. Maybe you have lower tone in your hat. And well, and so it takes you just a little bit longer, a smidgen more frustrating than it might be for someone else. So we'll put another box in action, but you know, it's not, not a full box, it's only a little one. Let's do about, about there. But that is something that tends to be a little bit invisible. It's something that we don't necessarily see every day or that we're, that we're aware of in the same way that can add to this, to this, um, the action section when we're thinking about our overall threshold. Uh, and then, okay, now you're gonna, okay, great. We have our meds, fantastic. We're getting, we're making to make our lunch, perfect. You normally have a ham and cheese sandwich, but you look in the fridge and you realize, oh boy, we are out of ham. We're going to have to do something different. So now you're looking at the ingredients, trying to figure out what you're going to do instead, which again, now we get another box and box. But also, now you have kind of had your, your morning routine dialed. And now you have to do an extra thing that's going to take a little bit extra time. Now we're starting to feel a little bit stressed about it. So we're also going to put a box in feeling. Uh, now let's say you are going to take the bus, um, to, to get to work, but maybe the bus is <laughs> one of the buses that kind of has a window when it comes sort of like a 15 minutes, like most of the time shows up around eight o'clock, but sometimes it'll be at, um, you know, 7.55. And so again, that stress of, am I going to be able to get there in time? Do I have everything I need? We're gonna put uh, another box in feeling. Uh, then maybe once we're on the bus, the bus is really loud. And maybe you're someone who is a little bit sensitive to sound. So um, we should put a box, this, this doesn't fit in a category perfectly, but let's put it in, in feeling. That, that sound gives you extra stress, and you're, yeah, it's just like a little bit extra in the box. But maybe you have a, maybe you have a tool. Maybe you listen to music and you're able to drown out some of that sound. So we'll make that box a little bit smaller. We have a tool that works for us, makes it a little more manageable. Perfect. Now, let's say you get into work and most maybe you really like your job or, and most of the people there, but maybe there's one coworker who's there, who's there who is a, it's, it's kind of difficult to deal with. 
Um, and working with them, it's you have to really work hard to um, to work with them well. So we'll put we'll put say one more one more box in feelings here. Okay, great. So you've made it to work. Fantastic. And when you look at our, our boxes here, they're fairly spread up. The feelings box is a little higher uh, than the thoughts and the actions is the lowest. But none of them have reached the threshold until you, these are not in all, these are not happening in isolation. They are all happening all at once. So let's stack them all together. So I'm going to take a copy of this. Stacking it up on thoughts here. Oh, it's a little wild. Here we go. Okay, so if we stack it up, we're still below the threshold if we stack up the feelings and the thoughts. Okay, Whew. not too bad. Now let's think about the actions too. We'll grab a that and stack it. How close do we get? Ooh, now we are right at the edge of our threshold because of all of these little pieces of executive functioning, all these little things that you have to do to get work that add up. Um, and you know, and some of them we're able to make smaller with some tools, which is fantastic. But just by getting to work, we are already getting close to the top of that threshold. So I'm gonna stop my share. And so that is, yeah, an example of all, like of breaking it down into thoughts, feelings, and actions. And then by breaking it down, it helps us understand which of those boxes we can make a little bit smaller. And which are kind of, which are kind of stuck. Like the coworker one, it's probably kind of stuck. Um, and that's kind of what I have for, for this section of my presentation. I'm not sure if we're going to do questions at the end or what your guys' plan is, but um, that's what I have for now. Thanks so much, you guys. I just finished reading the Hannah Gadsby uh, memoir, 10 Steps to Nanette. And, um, you know, here is a very successful stand-up comic who who's on the autism spectrum and who ha employs a lot of those techniques. She wears the same kind of clothes all of the time to simplify that and around food too because she's sensitive to smells and textures and so she simplifies the range of foods that she eats in order to keep herself from becoming overwhelmed. Oh that's really cool. Yeah make, make some of those boxes smaller. <laughs> Well, you mentioned uh, sleep being a, an important factor and that um, for many people on and off the spectrum, <laughs> um, I think sleep is a, an issue. Um, are there any uh, tips or techniques that help to squish those boxes? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, this is very, I mean, there's kind of the regular sleep hygiene so can you build routines around sleep uh, that are consistent? Uh, the same going to bed time, the same wake up time, kind of creating a wind down routine, similar to, or it's comparable to a, someone getting ready for uh, like a football game where they go through the same routine every, every time before so that they're, by the time they get to the game, their body's ready for it. Our body will do the same thing for sleep. Um, and then, and there, so there's sort of like the basic tips you can try out. Can you make your space more comfortable? Or can you customize your space so that it works better for what you need to sleep well, whether that's really dark or cooler, or you need something heavy. Um, and then there are things that are sometimes a little bit more challenging, but if sleep is a significant issue, is there a way that we can change your schedule so that we can meet you where you're at, so that you're doing the work that you need to do at the best, at the, at the time of day that you are most ready to do it. Um, so an example of that is uh, like I have some kids who are homeschooled and we've I've worked together with their parents to start their day later so that they are mentally and physically a little bit more ready to start. And they have that opportunity to sleep in and um, rather than try and change their circadian rhythm, we're working with, with where it is. Again, that's not an option for everybody, but it's, it's a nice option when you can. Joni has a question in the chat. She writes, I have been using the iPhone to motivate my daughter to wake up in the morning for school. I am trying to wean her off of the iPhone. Is there a way to do this gently without overwhelming her? Yeah, okay. 
So it sounds like um, the iPhone is kind of that, like it's a motivational piece, but it also probably is um, regulating. <laughs> It's an activity that's predictable. You know it. You have control over it. You get to access it in the way that you want it um, to. And so it sounds like you would prefer not to have that time in the morning. Uh, and so the the first piece of it, I think, would be: um, is there a, like technology is such a useful tool? Is there a way to kind of turn that in that? like using the iPhone into a tool that helps set her up for the rest of the day. Like, is there a visual schedule and that's part of your, your uh, using the iPhone and creating the schedule. So rat, so maybe it's still having a little bit of that kind of motivating slash regulating activity, but then it continues to be a tool to get us set up for the next steps that are coming. Maybe breaking down some of the, the thought um, boxes so that rather than her having to do it, it's done virtually or automatically through through an app or something like that. Um, I would also, and then if like a lot of the time it's uh, kind of creating the, that checklist or finding a way to make it work for you. Maybe you could have like her sort of create her own. Uh, and then the last piece I think of is kind of picking what's most important. If Say the her threshold, like say we have a little bit of iPhone time in the morning, and that decreases the feeling box. Is that um, worth it? If it means if you, if you take it away and the feeling box gets bigger, is that worth it? If she meets or meets her threshold first thing in the morning. So again, thinking about you're kind of doing the external planning and prioritizing and figuring out what's most important for you guys and your family. Nicola, do you encourage your clients to disclose, to enable them to um, to feel more um, comfortable about uh, about um, asking for accommodations? That is such a good question. Uh, I rather than encourage or discourage, I would say that I typically have a conversation uh, and we talk about what the pros and the cons would be. Because there is a, depending, depending on the situation, there's a good chance I'm not in, say, that workplace or that, that but most often where it happens in that workplace. Um, and yeah, we talk about the pros and cons. So the pros are, yeah, it might be, yeah, you get more accommodations. Um, it might be easier to have conversations if the person that you're talking to understands where you're coming from. The cons, again, depending on the situation, might be um, people make assumptions about you and what you can and can't do and things like that. So rather than say encourage or discourage, I think it's important to have a conversation um, and kind of weigh out those pros and cons and go from there. Because there are some workplaces that you might choose not to versus other ones that you might perceive as being more more open and you might be more comfortable asking or disclosing in those those conversations here those um, spaces rather i am um, i have trouble envisioning um a person being in a workplace that isn't um, open-minded because would they survive in the long term if it's um if they're if they can't make a place for differences um uh, so some of the areas where I see that some accommodations could be made are around exactly that start time, number of hours per week, um, working remotely part of the time, um, working where lights are less obtrusive or sounds are less obtrusive or smells are less obtrusive. So um, all of those situations that might make a workplace more comfortable for an individual. Yeah, so those are great examples. Sure. Um, what about exercise and and the relationship to um, if if not, is there a direct relationship between um, a better executive functioning performance if you pair if you are living a lifestyle where you get some exercise, or is it mostly about um, that it enables you to reduce stress and anxiety because you're exercising or Ooh, that's, a, that's a really good question. I, um, I have not 
dived into that. So I don't think I can say for certain. Um, I also think that like a piece of it is, is individual. Like some people need, like I think often exercise fits with that regulation piece, which can have an impact if we're regulated are generally our threshold for executive functioning is a little bit higher. Um, but as to whether exercise helps your um, executive, or it helps improve your executive functioning directly, or exercise helps reduce stress and anxiety, which indirectly improves your executive functioning, I'm not 100% sure on. Okay. But, yeah. Thanks, Nicola, for your insight. I'm sure everyone found that very informative. Our next guest today is Zach Bloomkey. He is a job developer at Autism Pan Tech, which is a program at Douglas College that he'll be telling us more about. Zach is passionate about supporting and working with people that have diverse abilities. And prior to his current position at Autism Pan Tech, he was involved with two research projects in job development and served as a board member for the Greater Vancouver Job Development Network, where he assisted in organizing events and meetings for other job developers in the Lower Mainland. Take it away, Zach. Yeah, thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, so thank you very much for, for having me today. I'm just gonna uh, share my screen. Um, there we go. And by the way, uh, my pronouns are he, him. Um, and I just want to do a, a quick land acknowledgement. Uh, so I'm joining right now from the, the unceded territories of the Samiamu Nation and uh, Coast Salish, as well as the uh, uh, Qualicum, uh, no, not Qualicum, uh, Coquitlam and uh, Kakite Nations of which Douglas College uh, has their campuses. Uh, so thank you very much, as I said before. Uh, so Douglas College and the Autism Cantac program, which I'm a job developer on, is a federally funded program. And I'm going to share some information about, and there's some very um, cool and interesting things going on. So I'm going to be kind of splitting these up into two parts. Uh, so um, I'm going to do uh, stuff about the ACT program as we call it, and then I'll stop for questions and then I'll explain a little bit more about some software called RoboCoach that we are also using in the program as well. Uh, so moving along. Uh, so who, who are we? So we're a pretty big team. Um, Autism Can Tech is a national uh, research project. So it's taking place in multiple provinces uh, across the country. Uh, so it is the aim of is, is to support autistic youth to uh, learn entry level employability and technical skills to start careers in the digital economy. Um, so I think according to the last census, I believe the unemployment uh, for people uh, with autism was around 85%. Um, and obviously that's an untapped network of, of great talent um, that we believe uh, can enter the workforce. Um, so the program is offered through Northwest College in Edmonton. So Northwest College is the main contract holder. Douglas College has signed on uh, to deliver in British Columbia, and we are still accepting applications for our next cohort, which will be starting on October 31st. And I'll talk about more about what that application process looks like later. Uh, we are, of course, having uh, courses in Alberta and Saskatchewan, and then Humber College out of Ontario is having virtual and in-person classes. So the program, um, in, in terms of eligibility, um, is for people that are diagnosed or self-diagnosed as autistic between the ages of 18 to 30, um, citizen or permanent resident of Canada, and currently not employed and can legally work in Canada, confident using a PC, Microsoft Office, Google Suite, et cetera. Uh, so that's really important as we are kind of a, a tech-based program. So we learn everything from, uh, from data management, um, a little bit of coding in something called SQL uh, servers and stuff like that. So we deal in a wide variety of different things, audio, uh, engineering, 
um, and different things that we offer um, as part of Autism CanTech. Um, completion of high school or equivalent uh, exceptions will be considered and then really ready and willing to enter long-term employment. Uh, so this is a pretty lengthy program as I'm about to talk about. So it's two months in class, three hours a day, five days a week. So we teach employability and communication skills as part of the program, as well as, of course, those technical skills. So employability skills include, as you see on the screen here, uh, process management, teamwork, scheduling, stress management, as well as communication skills. We go over email etiquette business and workplace communication, um, as uh, those are a little bit different than our normal uh, everyday and, and friendship communication techniques uh, and situations. So um, this is uh, for two months of the program. And then the other two months are when we learn the technical skills. Uh, it being a six month program, we then have two months of workplace uh, uh, work experience. This is uh, part of also the classes I'll speak to on Fridays uh, is part of the job developers. So we teach classes on Fridays and we go over everything from resumes to cover letters to interviewing uh, to kind of um, finding out what you what you would like to do and how you want to take your skill sets forward and enter uh, the digital workforce. So as I said, the job specific tech skills, uh, so data cleaning, project management, using Microsoft Power Query, as well as SQL um, and Power BI software. So all these softwares are provided as a student of Douglas College and of Northwest College. Uh, so don't have to worry about purchasing any softwares or products um, and also um, upgrading your laptops or anything to, to attend the program is not needed. We use something called virtual machines, which allows the person to log into a, a virtual type computer that has the processing to do those larger uh, data sets that may be needed in the program. Um, so the, the tech skills, I will say, do come uh, kind of hard and fast, for lack of a better term, uh, because we are doing three hours a day is scaffolded on. So what we did the previous day, we'll then take that, that learning and move forward <coughs> with it and keep adding on to those skill sets. Um, so having that digital literacy um, is really important uh, because we don't unfortunately have too much time to, to go back and revise those past things. We do have one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings with the job developer uh, monthly to uh, talk about uh, how class is going. Um, and there are opportunities to uh, work on missing assignments um, should those occur, but there's only uh, a certain number before, unfortunately, uh, they would need to repeat that process of the program. So as I said, four months total, right? We have the job developers run class on Fridays. We also do the one-on-one -on -one <laughs> classes. Uh, participants have access to all supports provided by Norquest. Uh, we do uh, a lecture uh, in the morning and usually that lecture is no longer than an hour. We try to keep it down, take a break and then do the majority of it being hands-on. Uh, so lab components, lots of, uh, uh, practicing and hands-on practice is really important um, as that's where most of the learning happens, right? We can talk about computer theories and, and those 15 step process and sometimes even double and quadruple that. Uh, but in terms of doing it and getting that practice and understanding that process, it's really about having that hands-on experience, right? Practice makes perfect as they say. And I think that these four months before I move on to the next slide, I think this is a really cool and unique aspect of the project uh, in terms of having this four months be in class and then also two months work experience. So where I think the uniqueness of this program comes in, it is lengthy, it is a time commitment, it does come hard and fast, but those learnings, there's no pass or fail as long as those assignments are, are done, uh, then that person is passing. So 
with that, it's practicing those skill sets that's going to make that person a successful learner should that person want to move on to post-secondary uh, later on. Then we have that work, work experience component, and that will be, you know, do I want to move into the workforce? Is that something that I'm interested in doing? So it's really important to, that's the way that I kind of view it. It's, it's about putting those things into practice. How do I become a successful learner in what is very similar to a post-secondary setting in terms of lecture and then practice, and then also moving into the workplace of putting those things uh, into practical use. So the two months work experience is paid experience. Uh, those 200 hours, that's the big uh, thing that we're looking for within the work experience. So those 200 hours are usually uh, we communicate with the employer partners uh, and we do set up those work experiences for the person. Uh, that's not on the participant to do. Uh, that's on, on us to set those up for them. Those 200 hours completed over eight weeks. We are doing the math here. That's about 25 hours a week five hours a day, we suggest. Uh, so uh, there are some times that people get sick, that's all right. Uh, you know, things happen and we, we schedule those accordingly. But the big benchmark to complete the, the program is the 200 hours of work experience. Uh, we, we try our best to focus on the person's skills. So we also do that during the one-on-one -on -one appointments. We really like to, to dive in and see what those person's interests are, what their long-term goals are, uh, and uh, match uh, a, an experience to that. So we've been lucky in this past cohort that I'm uh, currently just finishing up with. Uh, we had somebody with a history degree and they were able to uh, again, it's a place that sells um, different antiques and stuff like that and do little write-ups uh, as well as researching and taking photos of the items. Uh, so that was really great to see. Um, that person <laughs> loved that experience as well as did the employer. That person went into culture and, and everything else of objects that are uh, in some cases almost a thousand years old. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. Uh, we've also had some uh, people take their interest in radio and their experience uh, working on servers and being able to uh, have a work experience with co-op radio based out of Vancouver, a little local uh, radio company. Um, so really tailoring that uh, their, their skills and strengths as well as their interests as much as possible allows people to have the best experience that we can and take that experience onto, onto future endeavors. Uh, the employer, as well as the participant, is supported in the work experience. So we check in. Uh, you can see a little little robot on the side here. That's our little robo coach. Uh, so we do use software that supports the employer as well as the uh, participant during their time. So we're always available. Uh, that's what we're there to do is to support. Sometimes we go in person. Sometimes it's just a phone call. Sometimes it's an email of saying, hey, I want to ask for this time off. Remind me again of, of what that process is and how to go about it. And we can help them with that for sure. Um, we've also had people saying, hey, you know, uh, I think like I'm not quite sure what's going on. I've completed everything in two hours that they assigned me to do over the five. What do I do for the rest of the time? Right? Oh, let me have a phone call with you. Let's talk it out. See if there's some other things that we can come up with for you to complete. Um, yeah, it's been a lot of fun work experience um, as a job developer. It's it's mine to to monitor, and I always that's where the blossoming happens. It's really great to see. Uh, so the participant schedule. Uh, so right now we are offering morning and afternoon classes in the program. So those times are 8.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. and then the afternoon one being 12.30 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. Each class has roughly, is, uh, roughly no more than, than 15 participants. Um, so smaller class sizes to allow that one-on-one -on -one. and also uh, that time goes into uh, work experience as well. So uh, there are different times that the participant has had other people from the program join them in that work experience opportunity to do similar things. Uh, but there's also people that have gone solo to some organizations and just been the only participant from, uh, from the ACT program at that 
uh, company at that time. So ACT participants are given a handbook as a guiding tool. And this ensures that they are fully aware of what's required uh, of them during their time in the program and, and what we're able to support them with as, as uh, the ACT program. Um, an orientation is held to ensure participants know how to set up their accounts. So we ensure that they know how to access those different types of softwares that they will be using during their time in the program, as well as when we move on to data, how to access that virtual machine that I spoke about earlier. Um, and yeah, yeah, that list for preparation used to be a lot longer. Once we got those virtual machines going, uh, it really eased a lot of worry because uh, some data sets can be quite large and take a lot of processing power in order to, to do those quick calculations. And has anybody ever encountered those old spinning wheels that we get sometimes randomly? It's the most frustrating things, even though it takes three seconds. Uh, so the fact that we've expedited that process really, really helps. Um, so the participants week, kind of as I, I spoke about earlier, breaking those down into the numbers here. So it's 16 weeks in terms of the education portion, uh, broken down to employability skills taught Monday to Thursday. And again, myself, the career uh, coach slash job developer takes over on the Fridays. And then our technical skills are taught the next eight weeks, uh, Monday to Thursday and then job developer on the Fridays. So the reason why we've done those employability skills at the beginning is because to get those resumes out uh, and to the employers and start negotiating and, and finding what those skills and strengths are and broker the best uh, placement opportunity for the participants, it's really helpful to have that information right at the beginning because usually by, you know, three weeks to, to a month before that work experience is scheduled to be happening, we like to set up coffee chats. Uh, so coffee chats are slightly informal interviews, which the participant will be meeting with the uh, prospective uh, employer partner uh, to kind of see what they might be doing. Both parties ask questions. And again, that's uh, that's brokered and mediated by the job developer to ensure both people are, are getting the information. Uh, across that they need to, and that that person is feeling comfortable should they be starting in that position in a couple weeks. Uh, so really, they should start to be thinking about and understanding uh, where they might be going um, weeks before the start date. So it's not just class ends on the Friday, you start somewhere on the Monday, you wait for an email come the Friday evening. That's not the case. Uh, we usually almost always give at least a week's buffer. In many cases, we try to give two, if not more. Uh, so us job developers. So there's three of us on the team right now, and I'll speak to those people uh, a little bit later on. Uh, so we're we're in the classroom, we're helping out. Um, it adds to us helping getting those uh, uh, those placements and saying that we've we've worked with these participants. We know you know their skills and strengths and which ways they uh, will take the information uh, best. Uh, so we also do some slight career coaching with that, meaning you know some uh, goal setting. Uh, so we work on SMART goals and practice setting of, of those goals. During their work experience, we support them. And then after the program, we do uh, a few workshops here and there in order to uh, move on to hopefully paid employment. Uh, and RoboCoach, I'm going to skip through here and uh, we'll go there. So we do have employer partners on board. Uh, as I said before, we have, uh, we've had everybody from radio stations, uh, to uh, BC assessment, they assess uh, properties, values, and stuff like that, um, to uh, art galleries, who else? Um, uh, lots, of, lots of different places, any places that uses data and um, has need for somebody with a strong attention to, to detail, um, as well as, as inputting of uh, data reports and things like that. And a lot of companies are now seeing the value of that as that digitizes things and then allows workers to be remote. Um, so we want to make those, those unique work experiences as much as possible. All employers uh, do receive a training program that they can access free 
Um, so they do that. Uh, they gain access to that just by by signing up to be an employer partner. Uh, within that training, it's roughly about five hours altogether for the employer. Uh, it goes over what is autism, roles of the job developer, supervisor, and mentor, uh, robo coach training, how to use that program, and defining job tasks and roles. Uh, people are also uh, during this time they will be signing an agreement uh, that states what they're responsible what the college is responsible for, myself, and then what the employer is responsible for. And within that, the tasks and duties will all be laid out there. Um, yeah, and that also allows the person to be covered um, for any workplace injury. They'll be uh, covered uh, through the province. Uh, so one of the really fun things to do is, is connect classroom skills to industry. I always use the the very Canadian, being, being a national program, the very Canadian example of uh, ice hockey. Uh, so in the classroom, we talk about those ice hockey rules and how those work. And then uh, within uh, moving to the work experience, we then start to play the game. Uh, so how do you take those rules and see them in motion? So participants are matched with a supervisor. Uh, th that supervisor will be you know, in the coffee chat with them. Uh, tasks are identified, what they're gonna be successful on, what they're gonna be doing. There are different times where we've had participants do lots of different tasks within the company. Uh, I had one participant last time uh, working on a, uh, a project that the company estimated to take about eight, eight weeks in total. So would have taken the whole work experience the person sat down, thought about it for, for a day, clicked through a couple things and came back the next day and was doing, I think, 100 entries in a day where people before could only do five. Uh, so they finished it in two weeks. Um, it's really great to see the amount of success, but then that left us with what's, what's left to do. So they were helping different things, uh, different people around here. Uh, becoming a slight assistant of sorts. And that's also a really great experience as well. So anytime that you're able to, to gain all those different experiences, that's another skill or um, experience that you can put down on your resume uh, for future positions. So during this time, participants uh, develop employability skills. They gain experience within the workplace, working within a team, uh, lots of different things and develop their network. Uh, so a lot of times, uh, we've had participants very focused on the task at hand. I say that's great. They're having success with it. Later half of the, um, the work experience, start focusing on trying to develop your network. That person in the cubicle beside you, that person that waves hello to you at the front desk every day. You know, we come up with some ways during our one-on-one -on -one meetings that we could open up that conversation uh, to develop that professional network that's so important for, for a lot of us to have. So additional supports, just check in the time, additional supports during work experience and beyond. Uh, so uh, this is our autism CANTAC team at Douglas College. Uh, so myself, uh, Brenna in the middle there and Sharon in the, in the bottom right. Um, so that's our team. We're all job developers as we have multiple uh, programs going on at the same time. Uh, so come right now we have two going. Uh, Brenna and Sharon are currently teaching class on the Fridays, and uh, and then we have one ending, we have one in progress, and we'll have, as I said before, another one starting on October 31st. So we're quite busy all over the place, uh, but we do keep it very, we communicate very regularly, and uh, people should have the same job developer for their one-on-ones throughout their time in the program. So there will be some continuity within that. Uh, so this is a research project. So I just want to, as you see on the footnote here, an optional component that is no withstanding in the ACT participation. So should the person be accepted into the ACT program and uh, choose not to be part of the research, they are still part of the ACT program. Uh, that has no effect on, on the progress of, of them in the program. It's something that they're able to opt into. Uh, so the big research objectives is to understand the barriers that exist for the autistic community to have meaningful uh, employment, 
to learn about the experiences of the employers and what supports they need to enhance inclusion and accessibility in their workplaces and employment practices. This is done through uh, focus group interviews um, and uh, photography as well. So that's a really new and developing one. That's really cool. They uh, participants are welcome to take photos and submit those uh, with a little caption of what this uh, photo means to them. Uh, it's a really fun and creative way to uh, to share information. Um, yeah. So in terms of the research, uh, as we are a federally funded program, we're only funded for. Uh, a short period of time. So we're going into our third year next year, uh, which uh, will be the end of the current funding. And then we're obviously reapplying for more funding. Um, yeah, so within that, we provide timely re reports. We want to demonstrate use of information and uh, the, the federal government, of course, does project performance monitoring uh, to see how we're doing. So how are we doing? Uh, so we have a couple quotes here uh, from different people. Um, and uh, so as this is a national project, you'll notice Jennifer Cassidy from the city of Edmonton says, the support we've been getting from everyone uh, at Norquest is amazing, especially from the career coach has been amazing. I wish all the work experience students that come to the city receive the kind of support uh, that Autism Can Tech provides. Uh, so we've had uh, great experiences with a lot of people and of a lot of employers um, in our first cohort, there were employers that did bring people on and that continues on to our second cohort that's just finishing up here. Uh, people were brought on um, uh, full-time and also in, in a contract uh, basis to finish up the work that they've started. Um, yeah, so it's been really cool. Uh, employers are enjoying the experience and enjoying the training that the participants come uh, to to assist their, their companies with. Now from the participants, so we can see uh, Tanner on the right-hand side said, I had a stellar experience, although there were small bumps in the road, the supports provided a major role in ironing them out. I was able to lean on my teachers and counselors, so they made accommodations to make my experience amazing. Um, we've had people uh, gain a lot of, uh, social circles and groups uh, we were asking them uh do you want to you know uh come to this uh we were setting up some some workshops for people that have finished the program and they're saying oh i can't make that day i'm going to uh go see a movie and, and go to the bar with so and so afterwards so there's been some real lasting relationships that have also been developed uh within the program that's great to see i think that during covid we could all use <laughs> some more uh, as social engagement um, and and uh, larger social circles for sure. Uh, the parents, uh, so the guardians are also a big part. So this is from Cheryl Neal. This program did exactly what it was intended for, giving the autistic son some direction, hope, goals, motivation, and most of all, confidence. He starts his first official job for a software development company on Monday, and we couldn't be more excited for his future. Uh, yeah, so where we're going. So applications can be sent here uh, to autismcantech.ca. We do have our own website and all applications are sent through that online medium. All right, I'll, I'll take a drink of tea. I, was, I had a lot of information to get through in half an hour. So thank you everybody for that. Uh, yeah, any questions? Um, Zach, just to be clear, um, because this is a federally funded research project, um, I'm, I'm, my understanding is that there's no tuition or no cost to the participants. And I yeah, think. yeah. How did I forget that? Yeah, it's yeah. no cost. Yeah. Even for the, um, yeah, it's, it's free to attend should you, should you be accepted into the program. So there is a bit of an intake process. Uh, we do interview uh, the participants uh, to make sure that this program is a fit. Uh, we don't want somebody uh, doing a six month program uh, and everything else when they're just looking to improve their resume. Uh, that wouldn't be a best use of your time and there's better places to, to get that support. So we do interviews to make sure that those goals are aligned and this fits what they want. Okay, and also if you've got uh, 
a year beyond this year within the three-year mandate or three-year opportunity, how many more intake sessions of 15 do you have in this current cycle of funding? Yeah, the, the, uh, so our last one will be finishing up because it is a six-month program and everything has to be wrapped up. Right. Our last one is October 31st. Okay. So but, if there... Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just wondering, uh, you've got three years within this cycle of funding. So how many more intakes will there be within that three-year period? Yeah, so we're at the end of year two right now. Okay. So it ends in the spring. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, so that's that's the end of year two, but you have one more year, right? Well, <laughs> technically, it's, it's the third year because okay. it goes by fiscal. Okay. Yeah. So you... you... We're done. You're After done. October. Oh my yeah. gosh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, time flies. Okay. So um again, so that's concerning to anybody who might want to um start. This is a last session, right? Yes, potentially. We are hoping that there are funding uh obviously extensions on funding. I've put my email here. If people are interested in um in other employment programs should be on that timing. Uh, there are, the Douglas College Training Group has different ones uh, for for youth and for, for people with disabilities. So there's quite a large network out there in terms of programming that the training group uh, organizes that I can let them know about. Uh, so I put my email up there should they want to ask me about directions. <laughs> Um, also, um, uh, I, again, I, just to be clear, it's yeah. all online, correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So everything is online. All classroom sessions are online right now. Um, the work experience could be in person. Mm -hmm. So there is, uh, there is a possibility, even though all the classes are virtual, uh, that it is in person. It, the work experience could also be virtual as well. Okay. Um, also, um, uh, I just wanted to tie it back to the executive functioning topic and say, and I'm wondering, um, over the course of the, the number of sessions that you've done, how has this program been influenced or adapted to um, accommodate executive functioning um, issues that or challenges that individuals might have? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. I think that the program has really helped um, over that six month uh, process, helped a lot of people develop those uh, executive functioning skills. Uh, so that includes into sleep schedules uh, that we we're speaking about earlier. That includes um, uh, setting uh, scheduling, um, checking of, of emails, uh, replying to emails. Quite often, we, uh, we, those first couple uh, months are a little bit bumpy in the consistency of those things. Um, and usually by, uh, by routine, by goal setting and breaking that thing uh, down, depending on the person, into achievable goals, um, the person does improve. Uh, so we had somebody that uh, was having issues with uh, scheduling and uh, checking of emails. And by the end, uh, they were the ones emailing us, attaching documents, uh, bang on the time they would send us a message through RoboCoach, hey, I'm here, I'm ready to work. Um, and it was, it was really awesome to see. And I think just that independence um, that's given to people um, as well as that, that confidence plays, plays a big part, yeah. Okay, so um, tell us about, so that ties into RoboCoach. All right, I just want to interrupt about... for a second. There was another message in the Okay, chat. go ahead, Aaron. Uh, Joni would like to know, once the research period is over, will this potentially become a regular curriculum option at Douglas College for future students? Yeah, that's a great question. We are hoping it does, uh, that depends on the, the funding by the federal government. Um, so everybody writes in different proposals and says what their ideas are and how they'd like to help uh, different populations. Um, and then 
the government funds those programs. So sometimes there are successful ones that run for almost decades in some cases. Uh, so there is a possibility of that. Fingers crossed that is the case uh, because we have had a lot of interest. Um, but should that not be the case, um, feel free to, to email myself uh, because the Douglas College, um, if you want to be a student of Douglas College and do a, a certain type of program, there are uh, the advisors as well as there is more career focused things that are done by the training group. And I can uh, recommend or, or give contact information uh, should one of those things be your goal. Also, Donna would like to know, is there a reason the program limits the intake to people between 18 and 30? Yes, that's a great question. So the program is uh, funded by the, uh, it's what the government refers to as a youth. And so this being a youth program, that's why it's, uh, it's geared towards uh, 18 to 30. I think that's one that we need to work on. It needs to be extended because um, um, many of our adults have a slower development trajectory. Yes, I agree. And so um, I think um, campaigning for increasing it at least to 35 would be appropriate. Yeah, I, I'm with you there. Zach, you will speak to us about your experience with RoboCoach and how that has um, helped to um, give, to find that balance between independence for participants and um, augment their time management organizational skills. Correct, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so RoboCoach um, is a, we always joke and say RoboCop because sometimes our brain works in funny ways. But a Robo RoboCoach was developed by a company out of Edmonton called Technology North. Uh, so this has been built to remove barriers, reduce support costs, and focus on sustainability. Um, so this program was developed specifically for people with ASD. It's been seven years of research um, and, and a purpose built. Uh, in order to one, facilitate uh, workplace communication and to allow better scheduling. Um, so it says verbal communication, tax management, training and satisfaction for all stakeholders. Um, so what this essentially does is it's, uh, it's accessible through your web browser and you log in as you would an email and you access it that way. Now, the people that have access are going to be um, in theory, and I'm going to talk about as if we're not in the ACT program, but it could be a support worker, a guardian, the participant, and the employer. So all four parties there could be part of the chat uh, to support the person in that workplace. In the ACT program, we have, of course, myself being the job developer as the, the support person, uh, some uh, guardians or, or parents do opt into that as well as uh, participants. Uh, but really it's a way for participants uh, that's really quick tech-based. Usually they're always doing their work on the computer. So it's really easy for them to access, let them know where we're, that they're there, ready to work, asking us any questions that may come up, um, and then also tracking and using a schedule. Um, this is adaptable, repeatable, and scalable with a strong focus on opportunity and sustainability. So we are uh, looking for how to uh, use this program as effectively, make it as barrier-free, both for the participant and for the employer, uh, because it is important that both parties are doing it. Um, at, you know, communication, if you're the only one in the chat room, doesn't really do anything. So uh, we needed to get employers on board as much as possible, as well as uh, participants. Um, so some of the features um, is there's a check-in every morning. Um, so anytime the person, the participant logs in, they're able to say how they're feeling that day with a little uh, uh, emotion beside it um, and, and check in that way. And then it asks them, is there anything new you'd like to report? Is there anything that you, um, are you ready to work? 
Uh, so there was an example of somebody uh, that came in from the ACT program that was using this as a form of check-in. And they came in and unfortunately their, their dog had passed away recently, uh, just the day previous. And so when it asked them, are they ready to work? They said, no, like, I, I think I need a couple minutes. And so uh, they were in a really nice accommodating uh, work experience with a really nice person. Um, and uh, I suggest that person texted uh, their job developer and suggested, you know, hey, talk to so-and-so. Uh, if you need five minutes, just let them know what's going on, that things may be a little bit different today. That's completely understandable. So they're able to do that, went back to RoboCoach, um, uh, talked to the person, went back to RoboCoach and clicked, I'm ready to work, and went on with their day. Uh, and so it's a nice little thing to, to check in. Even I ask myself some days, am I ready to work today? Uh, so it is a very beneficial tool. Um, and then it asks, gives them access to chat with the employer, ask them any questions without leaving their desks. Uh, a lot of people have cited uh, using RoboCoach and other chat functions in the workplace that it feels they're much, uh, they are much freer to ask questions through this medium rather than getting up, going over to the person's desk that can sometimes be, be intimidating. Uh, so we're, we're working uh, to be integrated with custom workflows. Uh, so Technology North has developed a demonstration workflow integration for document digi digitization. Uh, so this means that uh, when somebody is completing tasks, that the software will recognize that those tasks have been completed and check those off without a manual process. So that's still being trialed. Um, there's also a chat bot uh, that is automated and one day will be connected with a wiki uh, specific to that job site uh, or job process. Um, so right now they've had success with that with, uh, as I said, digitize, document digitization. So when the person scans or if they have a question of how to do a certain type of process, they can ask this uh, robo coach uh virtual robo coach on how to do that task and it will pull up the wiki link on what that process looks like so it's basically an all-encompassing at home uh troubleshooter uh for yourself um of course we're a little bit ways off in in working into that into data as there's quite a few number of factors that could be uh or hiccups um uh, so they're just working on getting that. Uh, but it's a really new um, Ling Huang, who's the CEO of Technology North, uh, developed this uh, for his son, who is uh, a person with autism. Um, and they are yeah, doing really, really well. I believe Ling uh, just got awarded uh, a local inventor or uh, a business award uh, in Edmonton. Um, so really great to see. It is gaining a lot of traction um, in different communities and uh, excited to see where this piece of software goes. It has um, things like this have been done uh, on a corporate level. I think this program, speaking to ACT now a little bit, the, these programs have existed by and been funded by private companies. And, um, and now it's about getting into public and how do we make the, these educational uh, program sustainable for for the autistic population. Oh, there we go. Coach is assistive technology supporting the management of teams of one to ten plus workers with autism of varying skill and capacity, with the aim of enabling productive workmanship. Workers with autism often need a little extra support in task focus, task step recall, and communication to develop productivity. RoboCoach offers tools to support these areas of employment to sustain and maintain the work opportunity. With RoboCoach, employers can assemble teams, assign tasks, and communicate with employees via chat while completing workflows crucial to business operations. Robo, the AI chatbot currently in production, is being designed to observe and respond to signals offered by workers to assist the job coach in staying on top of the needs of each team member during each shift. Additionally, RoboCoach offers employees a rich knowledge tool set to provide workers with autism all the information required to prepare for and execute tasks successfully during training and in a real production environment. 
If productivity demands a workflow tool set and data collection, a specialized module can be developed inside RoboCoach to enhance your team's productivity. RoboCoach is what every inclusive employer needs and wants to support their productive team of workers with autism and take them to the top of their class. RoboCoach, supporting inclusive employment to develop workers with autism capable of excellence. And then tying that in with the executive functioning, I think that, you know, that scheduling piece that we're talking about and this software and how it assists with those things, I think is, is uh, really helpful and, and great to see that that has been recognized by, by people that are inventors and, and uh, focused on, on assisting that population. Yeah. Any questions? Um, Zach, um, at some point when, okay, so first of all, there, I, I can really see the usefulness in the employer and the employee situation for sure. But I know that um, a lot of families here um, will, uh, are, are at the phase where their adults are adults, and they want to ensure as much independence as possible for their adults and they so they'd like to be less in their person's face yes and so um an assist like this would um would be a win-win for the family and for the individual and allow them to have those uh, checkpoints to ensure that they're on track and reduce the amount of um parent directed advice correct um, so um glad to hear that there's some development interest moving in that direction um so and you said there's a ways to go do you have any idea as to how how that would be um i know things are moving from my perspective pretty quickly to think where we started with RoboCoach, the interface has changed three times over to be more effective and so many features have been added to it. Um, I would say that it depends on the uh, kind of the employer and, and um, how they would use it. Uh, we've used it primarily as a, as a chat function. Um, and then some employers have been putting in schedules as well. So really it's about getting that research um, uh, information about the technology and also about the program because they're kind of two in the same of what are the benefits, how people enjoyed using it and, and what other features would they like to be seen add to it. Um, and then we take that information or Technology North does and adds that to, to the repertoire hopefully. So maybe when you make your next leap in um, yeah. in um, technology or um, uh, ability to deliver this, you could come back and do a with a real life a real life demonstration of people working between with RoboCoach between each other with RoboCoach, so we could see how it works exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Zach, for telling us about your programs. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Aaron, I think we're ready to wrap if there's yeah. any other questions. Thanks everyone for being here. Thank you to our presenters. Bye. Today. Bye. Bye.